It's not every day that a family of five is found bludgeoned to death in their home, but that's exactly what happened to the G family in the sleepy little town of Beeson, Illinois, back in September of 2009. On September 21st, 2009, the G family of Beeson, Illinois was found bludgeoned to death with a tire iron. Now, this was a family of five that were so bloodied when first responders arrived on the scene, they weren't even sure of their cause of death. Um, altogether, this family of five took about 158 blows with this tire iron. So before we get into all the details and what the prosecution thinks happened, let's kind of backtrack a little bit. So if you haven't heard of Beeson, Illinois, you're not alone. It is a tiny little town near Springfield, Illinois, population of about 189. So if any of you have grown up in a, in a small town like I have, you know how everybody knows everybody. So news of this death sent shockwaves through the community. And in fact, many of their friends and family didn't even believe that it happened until they walked outside, went down to the house and saw all the cop cars. So let's start with the victims of this tragedy. So we have the G family. So we've got uh, Rick G, who was 46 years old at the time of his death. He was married to Ruth G, who was only 39 years old. Now, Ruth had two children from a previous relationship. We have Justina, who was 16, and Dylan, who was 14. And then together, Rick and Ruth had Austin, who was 11, and then Tabitha, who was three years old at the time of the attack. Tabitha was the lone survivor. She too had been brutally beaten and first responders actually thought she was dead when they first arrived on the scene, but somehow she miraculously survived. So now we have this heinous murder. No real cause, no suspects. Nobody knows why somebody would have targeted the, the G family. Um, by all accounts, they were upstanding citizens. They didn't have any enemies, no criminal backgrounds. They really had nothing to go on at first. So while investigators were going through the home, they found a perfect bloody handprint on the sink. Now, mind you, they didn't know who this bloody handprint belonged to. Could have very well been one of the victims or it could have been the killer. So they take the handprint, wait for that to be analyzed. They also had a perfect imprint of a shoe right outside of the G family home. Now this particular shoe had a very distinctive tread, so they were easily able to narrow down the actual make of the shoe. So again, suspecting that this is probably the shoe that the killer wore. By a stroke of luck, a neighbor down the street the night of September 21st was out walking his dog around midnight and he saw a gray truck with his tail or headlights on going through town. And he noticed like, oh, they didn't go all the way through. They stopped in the vicinity of the G family home. So he made a note of that. And then of course, after the murders, he reported what he saw to the police. So police thought they were looking for possibly a gray truck. The neighborhood also said that the gray truck had chrome exhaust pipes in the bed of the truck. So that's a pretty distinct feature. Police also believed there was no way that someone could have murdered this entire family and have gotten away unscathed. So they uh, immediately put out an APB for somebody driving a gray truck with the chrome exhaust in the bed of the truck. And then they also believed this murder was probably injured or at least had a lot of scratches and bruises on them. So that's really all they had to go by. Um, the G's immediate next door neighbors and across the street neighbors didn't hear a thing that night. So again, nothing to go by there. So a few days um, had gone by and of course they're analyzing the handprint, trying to figure out what's going on. In the meantime, little Tabitha is in the ICU clinging to life. So this is graphic, just a warning, but her injuries involved her being beaten so bad that her right ear was actually torn away from her scalp. And because her skull had been crushed, they actually had to remove a part of her skull because her brain was swelling. So they had to allow for that brain to swell and then go back down. They had no idea if Tabitha was going to live or die, or if she did survive, what the extent of her injuries were going to be. Now, here's where I need to mention that Rick had another daughter. So he had a grown daughter around 30 years old from a previous relationship. Her name was Nicole G. 
Nicole just lived two blocks down from the family. Of course, she was devastated when she heard the news that this happened, and she had been going to visit Tabitha on a regular basis. Tabitha had a police officer on guard outside of her hospital room 24 hours a day, because again, they didn't know who did this. They didn't know if the person would be coming back to get Tabitha. So they had a cop there at all times. Nicole had been married to a gentleman named Christopher Harris. Christopher was 30 years old at the time that these murders occurred. Now, even though they had gotten divorced a couple years before, they kind of had one of those on and off relationships and they had been together since Nicole was 15 years old. They had two children together, um, I believe a nine year old and then also a newborn. So. Uh, it, at the time of the murders, though, they were kind of off again. So Christopher was actually living in his brother's house, his brother Jason Harris, who was 22 years old. They didn't live in Beeson. They lived about 25 miles north of Beeson in another small town called Armington. So that's where he was. So, of course, when a crime like this occurs, the police are going to look at friends and family first and foremost. So since Nicole was the only survivor, it's only logical that they would look at her, see where she was the night that these murders occurred. She had actually been working and that was corroborated. So she was out as a suspect. Um, they you know, obviously questioned Christopher, um, her estranged husband. And by all means, Christopher had a really good relationship with his in-laws. Um, there, there was no issues there. There was no hostility. Um, and he had said, hey, you know, my brother and I had been out drinking that night. We weren't even, weren't even in Beeson. And Jason backed up Christopher. They'd been to a couple small towns, uh, small town bars in the area. And again, that was backed up. So he was ruled out as a suspect. So <laughs> cops were like, great, we have nothing to go on right now. Um, few more days go by. The family has a mass funeral. So they're all buried together. Christopher and Nicole attend the funeral. Christopher's there is, is, is they're both going to visit Tabitha and making sure that everything's okay. Um, this is where things start to get interesting. So on one of their visits to the hospital, Christopher was actually leaving. And for some reason he was going down on, uh, in the elevator by himself. I'm not sure where Nicole was, but it also happened to be at the same time, there was a changing of the guard. Um, so the new cop was coming on duty to guard Tabitha's hospital room. So as Christopher and the police officer are going down in the elevator, the cop happens to glance down and sees the type of shoe that Christopher is wearing. And he notices it's this very distinct shoe that they have the shoe print of that they'd found outside of the G family house the day after the murder. So he's like, hmm, interesting. So the cops, although they had already questioned Christopher and he had an alibi for the night of the murders, they asked him to come to the station to see if they could take an imprint of his shoe. He agrees. So Christopher goes to the police station. They take an imprint of the shoe that he was wearing and lo and behold, it does not match the imprint. Um, although it is the same tread mark, it is a half a size bigger than the shoe print outside of the G family home. They also know that Christopher drives a gray pickup truck, but there's no chrome exhaust pipes in the bed of the truck. So they're starting to, you know, their spidey senses are tingling. They're like, okay, he's got a gray truck, but it doesn't quite match what the witness said the truck looked like the night of the murders. He has the same distinctive shoe, but it's a half a size off. So they have to let him go, right? So I believe it's 10 days after the murders. Guess what? The handprint on the sink comes back. It doesn't match any of the victims, but it's a perfect match for Christopher Harris. So they immediately go to Christopher Harris. He is staying with Jason at Jason's house in Armington, Illinois, and they arrest Christopher for the murder of the G family. The police had a search warrant to search Jason's house. While they're searching Jason's house, they find a key piece of evidence. So this is where I need to mention something. There was nothing missing from the G family home the night of their murders, except a laptop computer. What do they find in the bed of Jason pickup truck underneath a tarp? The missing laptop computer. Bingo. So there's more evidence that Christopher was there, but maybe Jason was there too, right? They also find something um, by the bed of the pickup truck that could account for the fact that the neighbor said he saw chrome pipes. They had this weight bench that was tipped upside down. If you put it in the bed of Chris's truck, it looks like two pipes. So 
what they're assuming is the neighbor must have seen this in the back, back of the pickup truck and assumed that it was chrome exhaust pipes, but it was actually this weight bench. So they arrest Jason as well. So at this point, they don't know, were they both involved in the murders? Was only one involved in the murder? Um, and from the beginning, Christopher Harris said, nope, I was not involved. I wasn't even there. Not guilty, not guilty. I would never do anything like this. Jason said the same thing. Now you would think that the townspeople would be relieved. Oh my gosh, finally somebody's arrested. We can stop, you know, locking our doors at night and, and everybody was on edge during this time. But it was the exact opposite of that. Um, you know, the townspeople knew Christopher. He had lived in Beeson for many years. He'd been with Nicole for many years. They thought the cops had the wrong guy. They thought there's no way that he could have done this. And in fact, Nicole stuck by Christopher got on her social media and said the cops made a mistake they just wanted to arrest somebody there's no way that christopher would have murdered my family so interesting right um and in fact while christopher was in police custody christopher called his stepmother to say i didn't do this keep locking your doors because obviously this maniac is still out there i never would have hurt this family so now we get to the trial and the trial doesn't happen of course until a few years after the murders um, and they actually moved it from the the area of Beeson, Illinois up to Peoria County because they just didn't feel like they would get a fair trial um, in what I believe was Logan County. So it's moved to Peoria and at this point, you know, they don't really have a solid why. Christopher's still saying he's not guilty. Nobody can figure out why he would have gone and murdered his entire in-law family. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense, especially when you think about the fact that he tire ironed a three-year-old. And, and remember, Christopher had two small children. So this isn't like somebody that, that wasn't around kids. He didn't have a heart. His ex-wife is sticking up for him. And also Christopher had no history of violence. He had no criminal background except for 10 years prior, I believe he was caught with a marijuana and wrote a bad check. But there's, there's no history of violence whatsoever. So cops are trying to piece together the why, what happened, and then this is where something really interesting happens. So they offer Christopher's younger brother, Jason, a plea deal. They said, Jason, we'll take away the murder charges. We're gonna take away life in prison. It'll be reduced to 20 years, but you have to tell us what happened. So Jason, who has denied even being there this whole time, comes up with the story of what happened that night. So. I'm gonna go through what Jason said happened, and then I'm gonna talk about what Christopher said happened that night. So according to Jason, the two brothers did start their night off, uh, you know, going to a couple little bars around the area. They were drinking, they were doing coke. Um, Jason said then that Christopher was trying to hook up with, with somebody. So he wanted to have sex with a woman. Um, so he started calling old girlfriends. They started driving around the country, drinking and driving. You know, they're pitching the cans out the window. They go to a, an ex-girlfriend's uh, house in McLean, Illinois. Uh, she either didn't let them in or wasn't home. They tried a couple others, no luck. He said, hey, let's go by Nicole's house in Beeson. Well, because Nicole was working, she wasn't home. So then Christopher allegedly told Jason, you know what? I think the last few times I've been around Justina that she was coming on to me and let's go over there. I'm going to hook up with her. Now, remember, Justina is only 16 years old. And I have to think the amount of time that Christopher had, had been with Nicole and knew that family that he had known Justina since she was a little girl. So that's icky to begin with, right? So Jason says that they pull up to the house Christopher gets out of the car, goes around to the bed of the truck and picks up a tire iron and walks in. Now, Jason said he thought to himself, that's weird that he has a tire iron. Why he didn't ask him why he was taking it to the, that into the house, I have no idea. But Jason said, Christopher walked into the house. Jason then got out of the truck to smoke a cigarette. And all of a sudden he heard thump, thump, thump and a scream. And he's like, what's going on? So he like crouched in the bushes. Couple minutes later, he sees Dylan, who is the 14 year old son, run out of the house. Christopher comes after him, bashes him a couple times with the tire iron, figures he's dead, goes back into the house. Apparently Dylan was not dead because he ran back into the house. And then a couple minutes later, Christopher comes out, 
completely soaked in sweat, breathing heavily, carrying the laptop, covered in blood. He gets into the truck and tells Jason in, I effed up, I killed them all, I didn't want to leave any witnesses, and just tells Jason to drive. Okay, so that's what Jason said happened. What Christopher said happened is, and now he's finally admitting to being there, um, he said, yes, we were out drinking, we did a little coke, and then we decided to go see if we could get some pot from Rick. And Rick and Ruth were, you know, open about their pot use, so that's not unusual that they would go there to get some. He said that they pulled up. When he walked into the house, he found the family already dead. Dylan is standing there with a knife in his hand and attacks Christopher. So he's saying Dylan tire ironed his entire family. He happened to walk in in the middle of this and then he sees the tire iron on the ground, fights off Dylan, kills Dylan, freaks out, sees the laptop that's open, assumes that there's a camera on the laptop and he's scared that it got recorded. So he grabs that, got back into the truck, told Jason to go which sounds a little implausible, but I'm gonna tell you some things about Dylan in a second here that um, I'm not sure that the jury was allowed to hear all this evidence. So it's not as ludicrous of a theory when you hear some things that when you initially hear it, you're like, but that doesn't make any sense. So the reason he said he didn't call the police is because he was so overwhelmed. He didn't want Nicole to know what had happened. He didn't want Nicole to know that he killed his brother, even if it was in self-defense. Um, he tossed the tire iron and his pair of shoes out the window by a creek. They were later recovered when Jason had told him where Christopher had tossed them. And the next day he had bought the exact same pair of shoes, a half a size bigger. So that's why the shoe print didn't initially match. So. In order to go forward with this theory that Dylan had killed his family, you, you obviously have to figure out what was going on with Dylan. So what the defense did is they actually subpoenaed his school records. And by all accounts from, from witnesses, family, friends, they have all said that Dylan was a very troubled child from like day one. Um, he had a laundry list of things that he'd done in school, including, you know, just disturbing the classes. He had apparently, um, not too long ago had hit one of his fellow classmates, broke the kid's, uh, glasses, bloodied his nose. He had also taken a razor blade and slashed the, um, school bus's interior with a razor blade that he'd stolen. He also made a comment at one point that he hated school. He wished it would blow up and the school actually called the police on him. Um, there were other witnesses that said he was also abusive to his younger sibling, Austin, and that he had tried to drown him in a pool one time and was just generally unstable. Um, also, it was, it was said that he stayed in his room most of the time in the total dark and just played violent video games at all times. There were also a lot of holes punched in the wall of his bedroom. So obviously there was probably some anger management issues there. The most damning testimony, I think though, um, the jury was not allowed to hear. So Ruth, his mother, had told a therapist back in 2007 that she was worried if they didn't get Dylan under control, she was nervous about what he would do. Now, Dylan was diagnosed with ADHD and he had been on a medication for it, but for some reason in the two years leading up to the murders, he had been off his medication. So. I don't know if that's a good thing, a bad thing, if it exasperated his behavior, but this is what Ruth told this therapist. Rick separately had told his mother, quote, I'm scared if we don't get Dylan under control, he's going to kill us all. So that is according to Dylan's grandmother. The jury, because that was considered hearsay, was not allowed to hear that testimony. Um, and the judge also said that Ruth telling the therapist that in 2007 was not relevant because she had said it two years prior. Maybe if she had made that comment recently, right before the murders, he would have allowed that. But, um, so jury was not allowed to hear all of that. And in fact, um, there were school teachers that testified in Dylan's defense and said, yeah, you know, he was a hyperactive kid, but he didn't, uh, you know, mean to cause any harm. He was, you know, at heart a good kid. Apparently he had recently joined the wrestling team and his wrestling coach even said, if there was one fault of Dylan's, it, it's that he wasn't aggressive enough. 
So you have the defense trying to pin this on, uh, you know, the mass murders on Dylan and that Chris had just, uh, you know, killed Dylan in, in self-defense. You have Jason saying, absolutely not. Chris did it all. Um, ultimately, at the end of the day, the jury found um, Chris Harris guilty on all counts. He is currently serving life in prison. Now, he has to this day maintained that he is innocent, that he would have never done anything like this, um, and he's never really wavered from his story. Jason was convicted on lesser charges, so he is currently serving 20 years in prison, which means he will be out in 10 years or so. Um, the thing that makes this so interesting to me is the fact that there's not a real why behind it. So, you know, let's say that Chris Harris did go to the house and he did do this. Why would somebody who has no prior history of violent behavior, even if you are coked up, go to the house and and tire iron an entire family so much that each person had around 50 blows to their body, including a little three-year-old? It doesn't make any sense to me. And unless there's a bigger reason why, and that just never came out, I find that, you know, and, and I know this is technically not an unsolved mystery, but it, it kind of feels that way to me because it's, it's not really a tangible reason. I don't really know if I buy the defense's theory that, that Dylan committed these murders. I mean, I guess it's plausible. Yes, children have flipped out before and they have killed their families and their siblings. Um, but what are the odds that Chris would walk in a little after midnight on the one night that this occurs. I find that a little implausible as well. Um, and to me, the real victim in all of this is little Tabitha. So Tabitha did survive. Um, and I had to do a little digging because I saw different accounts of, of who actually adopted her and where she's at now. But um, she was adopted by her paternal grandmother and she is living about an hour from Beeson, Illinois. She would be what, 14, 15 years old now. Um, and I haven't seen any recent updates about her. I'm sure that they wanna keep her privacy intact. You know, obviously she's been through a lot. Um, I don't know how extensive her brain injuries are. So, you know, I just hope that she was able to make a full recovery and that she's doing well. Um, and then the last reports I saw about Nicole G, because Nicole is truly a victim in this as well. Her entire family was murdered. Um, I don't know if she still feels that Christopher's innocent, um, cause this is interesting. So when he was first arrested, she took to her social media, you know, and proclaimed he was innocent. He couldn't have done this. A few years later, when the trial started, she was actually supposed to testify in his defense and she didn't show up <laughs> at the courthouse. So I don't know if she had a change of heart or not. I couldn't find anything that publicly said that. And in fact, I think she has since moved to Florida. So she has probably and just tried to start her life over. Um, I, I I do believe that the townspeople of Beeson are still haunted by this tragedy. Um, in fact, a couple of years ago, they actually had a controlled burn of the house that this occurred in. So the house is no longer there. Um, they have dedicated a playground in the memory of the G family children. Um, so there is a playground nearby. Um, but it's just one of those cases that really leaves you wondering why. It, it was such a senseless tragedy. There was no reason for it. Um, and it just leaves you with more questions than it does answers. Guys, thanks for watching this video. Um, please give a thumbs up if you like. If you want to know more about unsolved murders or just strange murders in the Midwest, please subscribe to my channel. Um, I would love to hear your comments, especially those that have firsthand knowledge of this case. Please drop me a comment below. If there's any murders, mysteries that you would like me to talk about on this channel, again, please drop me a comment. See you next time.